Welcome back. We are discussing American imperialism and we're going to turn our attention now towards Cuba. So Cuba was still ruled by Spain at this point. And in the late 19th century, there was an unsuccessful Cuban nationalist attempt to overthrow Spanish rule. And Spain decided to send an autocratic general named Whaler and over 100,000 troops to try to crush these revolts. Whaler forced civilians into armed camps and tens of thousands of them starved and died of diseases. And American press gave Whaler the title of the butcher. And there's a graphic image here. I just wanted to hide it, but I'm going to reveal it now to demonstrate the level of brutality that Cubans faced during this period. This also launched into the period of, or rather, this is a good example of something, a concept called yellow journalism. Yellow journalism was a press tactic to try to actively promote pro-war sentiment and use sensationalistic headlines and imagery and reported stories about crime, disaster, and scandal. And one of the best examples of a journalist who really latched onto this concept was a man named William Randolph Hearst. And so his paper, The Journal, printed exaggerated and false accounts of Spanish atrocities in Cuba. And Americans increasingly, when they read these stories, they would turn to the government and try to tell them to do something about all of this. So as Americans read headlines about Spanish misrule in Cuba, they wanted the United States to actually fight Spain. Another term that's worth mentioning here is something called jingoism, and that's an intense form of nationalism calling for an aggressive foreign policy. Expansionists demand that the U.S. take its place with imperialist nations of Europe as a world power. And not everybody is a believer of jingoism. Uh, Presidents Cleveland and McKinley believe military action was morally wrong and economically unsound. This cartoon that you're seeing here, the interpretation essentially is that William Randolph Hearst, through yellow journalism, was responsible for the Spanish-American War. So, I'll, I can talk about the DeLome letter while we're here as well. Um, in 1898, there was a Spanish diplomat who wrote a letter that was leaked to the press and printed on the front page of William Randolph Hearst's journal. And... Uh, this letter was highly critical of President McKinley, and it was considered an official insult against U.S. national honor. So again, we see the role that journalism also plays in what was happening in Cuba. This was William Randolph Hearst, by the way. And this was the house that he built with the riches that he made from his newspaper, from his magazine. Okay, and... I'm not going to interpret this cartoon because I fear that I may make this video too long, but feel free to pause and do so yourself. Let's get into the Spanish-American War now. So, Teddy Roosevelt at this point was Secretary of uh, the Navy, not Secretary of State. Uh, there used to be a Navy department. And he thought that President McKinley's foreign policy was too weak. In fact, he allegedly at one point said that President McKinley had the backbone of a chocolate eclair. And um, Teddy Roosevelt decided to actually resign from his position as Secretary of the Navy to go fight in Cuba. And his volunteer cavalry was nicknamed the Rough Riders. And in many ways, that allowed Teddy Roosevelt to make a military name for himself and of course, we know at this point in history, having a military record is a very important part of the presidential job description. One of the primary causes of the Spanish-American War, or at least the most immediate primary causes, was the sinking of a naval ship called the USS Maine. So it was less than one month after that letter I discussed earlier, the DeLome letter here, that the USS Maine, which was anchored in Havana, Cuba, exploded and 260 Americans on board were killed. That press, the yellow press, blew up and it accused Spain of blowing up the ship, even though later investigations determined that the explosion was an accident. 
regardless, the, yo the yellow press did its job. And Americans wrote to their Congress people, they addressed the president, they demanded war. And so McKinley gave in and he delivered a message to Congress asking that they declare war on Spain. And uh, I should rewind. McKinley did try a couple of things first. He did issue an ultimatum to Spain demanding for a ceasefire in Cuba and Spain agreed but then again, the press and Congress kept pushing for this war. And McKinley, again, he yielded. And so here's what he said in his war message. First, he said, and this is a quote, put an end to the barbarities, bloodshed, starvation, and horrible miseries, end quote, in Cuba. He also wanted the U.S. military to protect the lives and property of U.S. citizens living in Cuba. And he wanted to end, quote, the very serious injury to the commerce, trade, and business of our people, end quote. And lastly, he wanted to end, quote, the constant menace to our peace, end quote, arising from disorder in Cuba. So you can tell that even though cartoons like this make it seem like the United States is attempting to liberate the Cuban people, there's also clearly something in it for the Americans. So how does the U.S. formally go to war? Um, it's some, it, the, the actual declaration, it was called the Teller Amendment. It was Congress's joint resolution to authorize war. That was in April of 1898. It declared that the U.S. had no intention of taking political control of Cuba. And it also stated that once peace was restored to the island, the Cuban people would control their own government. The war itself, it was a very, very short war. It was only 10 weeks long. Uh, President McKinley nicknamed it a splendid little war. The primary theater of this war was in the Philippines. And Teddy Roosevelt, uh, again, at that point, let's see. Um, yeah, he at that point was, I'm trying to think about my timeline. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm trying to do this thematically, not chrono chronologically. Uh, at that point, the assistant secretary of the Navy, uh, as a very expansionist assistant secretary of the Navy, he sent a large all-steel naval fleet to the Philippines and it easily defeated the Spanish fleet and also with the help of the Filipino nationalist rebels who also wanted the Spanish out, the Americans captured the port of Manila by August 13th of 1898. But let's go to Cuba where the war was also taking place and this was a more difficult victory for the Americans to secure. More than 5,000 Americans died in the Cuban theater of the war, but most of them died due to disease instead of actual battle. Um, wounds. So I think 500 Americans died in battle. The remaining ones died of things like malaria, typhoid, and dysentery. And American and Cuban forces uh, combined ended up defeating the Spanish primarily because they were very poorly led and the U.S. destroyed the Spanish fleet at Santiago Bay and again Spain lost its navy and it asked for the rather uh, when Spain lost its, its uh, naval presence in this period, it asked for U.S. peace in August of 1898. Forgive me that I'm st uh, stammering a little bit here. I, I'm using notes more than usual. I'm not as good of a military historian, so I appreciate your patience. Anyway, the end of this war, uh, the treaty that was signed was called the Treaty of Paris, which loves to confuse all of us because it seems like literally every American war up until this point, not literally, I'm being facetious, it's peace treaty always seems to be called the Treaty of Paris. <laughs> so that's always confusing just to me. So if you're confused, rest assured, I've been teaching 15 years and I'm still all over the place with my treaties of Paris. Anyway, this was a controversial peace treaty. So um, the treaty, on the one hand, it recognized Cuban independence. On the other hand, the U.S. ended up acquiring two Spanish islands, Puerto Rico and Guam. And then thirdly, the treaty said that the United States could acquire the Philippines, the entire island nation, in return for $20 million to Spain. Not to, the, not to the Philippines, but to Spain, right? So many Americans, first, were not prepared to take over such a large Pacific island nation as a colony. And then the other thing to consider is that the United States won partially because Filipino nationalists helped them win. And so it suggests that the United States was willing to give the Philippines independence, but yet now that the Filipino people are, are asking for it, they don't want to give it, right? So there's this large division in opinion between imperialists and anti-imperialists. 
anti-imperialists believe that the United States taking possession of such a heavily populated area where the people are a completely different culture, a completely different race, was a violation of the Declaration of Independence because it was depriving the Filipino people of their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Also, there was a fear that this would entangle the United States into the political conflicts of Asia. But nonetheless, this peace treaty was approved um, 57 to 27, and that's only one vote more than the two-thirds majority needed in the Senate to ratify a treaty. So that gives you a sense of how controversial this treaty was. Forgive me, I forgot I had a map here. Okay, so what that does is that leads to now war with the Philippines. As you could imagine, the uh, Filipino population was outraged by this treaty. Filipino nationalists thought that Americans were going to give them independence. So they then turn against the U.S. military in the Philippines, and there's massive guerrilla conflict uh, that results. The leader of the uh, Filipino nationalist movement at that point, Emiliano Aguinaldo, was named president of the first Philippine Republic in January of 1899. And fighting between the United States and Filipino forces started only about a month after that. And by the time that Treaty of Paris was ratified the following year, the United States again attempted to purchase the Philippines from Spain, not from the Philippines, but from Spain for that $20 million. And so that was also an insult to the Filipino population because they saw it as undermining their own independence, their own self-determination. Why is the United States paying some other country for their independence, for their land? So... Um, At that point, it was clear to the Filipinos that the United States was not attempting to liberate them at all. And instead, it was interested in expanding its investments and other imperialist interests there. So U.S. forces occupied the Filipino islands under President McKinley's instructions. And the U.S. troops took three years to put down this insurrection. And by the end, one in every five Filipinos, men, women, and children included, had been killed. So... What's really, I, uh, you, can, you can't see me in any of these videos. You can't kind of see the facial expressions I'm making. What's really hard about teaching this content is that I'm thinking back on my experience learning American history and how I was never taught this at all. Um, and living in a part of the country, Southern California, that has a significant Filipino-American population, it's so important to be aware of this history what led to the the instability in this region and how this also triggered a wave of immigration out of the Philippines afterwards. So eventually we will see that, that many uh, Filipino refugees will find themselves in the United States. But we will get to that eventually later. Okay, so let's talk about what was going on after the Spanish-American War in terms of all these different territories. What is their status? Are they independent? It's very unique. It's very different depending on where. So first, there are a series of court cases that are attempting to answer this question. They're called the Insular Cases, and they take place between 1901 and 1903. And the question that these cases are trying to settle is whether the U.S. Constitution applied to territories like the Philippines and Puerto Rico. These cases reached the Supreme Court, and again, there's a few of them. I'm not going to mention them by name, but they ruled that constitutional rights were not automatically extended to territorial possessions. And they also ruled that only Congress had the power to grant such rights to these territories. So... First, let's ask, what does that mean for Cuba? So Cuba was slightly independent. It um, was now no longer part of Spain. It was creating its own constitution. With that said, the United States wanted Cuba to add an amendment to its constitution to clarify its relationship with the United States. And that amendment was called the Platt Amendment. This is 1901. And this amendment was an agreement between the United States and Cuba that was bitterly resented by Cuban nationalists. It had a few different parts. So the first part was that Cuba had to agree to never sign a treaty with a foreign power that impaired its independence. The second part was that Cuba agreed to permit the U.S. to intervene in Cuba's affairs to preserve its independence. And the third part was 
was that Cuba agreed to allow the U.S. to maintain naval bases there, including a permanent base in Guantanamo Bay. So think about the modern significance to that. This amendment was added to Cuba's constitution very reluctantly, and thereafter, Cuba's foreign policy was subject to U.S. oversight and control. That is until the uh, Castro Revolution in 1959. There's a handful of civil rights given to Cubans, including the right to vote. That was extended, though only, I believe, to literate adult white males with a certain amount of property. My notes are saying $250 or more worth of property. So what that did was that largely excluded the Afro-Cuban population and women from participating in politics. Moving on to Puerto Rico, in 1900, the Foraker Act said that Puerto Rico was an unincorporated territory, making its status still very ambiguous, but it sounds more like this could potentially actually become part of the United States based on that language. Cubans were considered citizens of Puerto Rico at that point, though, not of the United States, and any duties, any Puerto Rican goods that uh, were shipped to the United States, there were tariffs placed on them. So that made it seem like Puerto Rico was a different nation. The insular cases, which I mentioned a second ago, um, did establish that import duties, so any kind of tariff on Puerto Rican goods were, were legal. So that's also interesting. Then moving forward in 1917, the Jones Act granted US citizenship to all inhabitants of Puerto Rico, and it provided for limited self-government. It gave full territorial status to Puerto Rico, and it removed tariff duties on Puerto Rican goods coming into the United States. Puerto Rico then elected their own legislatures and governors to, uh, governor rather, to enforce local laws, and Puerto Rico could not vote in US presidential elections. They can vote in the primaries, however, and also a resident commissioner was sent to Washington to vote for Puerto Rico in the House of Representatives. So to this day, the status of Puerto Rico is in this in-between place. It is not a sovereign nation. It is a US territory. The population pays taxes. They do not have full voting rights and they also don't have full congressional representation. And this video I'm recording in 2022, we know that there has been an increased push among some uh, especially the farther to the left those folks are, for Cuba to become a U.S. state. So we'll see what happens with that over time. Okay, as I said at the very beginning of this video, there is some strong sentiment against imperialism as well. And this manifests itself, I think, most clearly with the founding of the Anti-Imperialist League. And this was founded in 1898. It's predominant leader was William Jennings Bryan. We explored him previously because he ran for president as a Democrat in the late 19th century. And other prominent members were Samuel Clemens, you would know him as Mark Twain, Andrew Carnegie, and those are probably the most recognizable names for you, but just interesting. We've come across those names before. You may find it particularly interesting that Carnegie was one of the members given that he was quite wealthy. And the American Anti-Imperialist League campaigned against annexation of the Philippines and other acts of imperialism. And others joined this anti-imperialist effort out of concerns of immigration and also the American identity. So not all anti-imperialists necessarily were progressive politically. Some of them were quite nervous about the sort of growing um, foreign influence on what the American identity was or what they perceived the American identity to be. Uh, women also took a pretty predominant role in anti-imperialist causes. We see, and this is an international effort, we see that many anti-racists, many anti-lynching advocates, also uh, just general civil rights advocates, W.E.B. Du Bois was a major a proponent of anti-imperialism. And as a member of the Pan-African movement, we can see that there is just this broad interest of these burgeoning superpowers to try to, to, to keep their hands off of, of these countries. So it's interesting to see that there are other people that belong to marginalized communities that are, that are supporting the anti-imperialist effort. Again, another fascinating political cartoon. I'm seeing that this video is very long. I didn't want it to be, <laughs> sorry. But so I'm not going to interpret this for you, but go ahead and do it for yourself. 
For those of you who made it all the way to the end, first of all, my goodness, my husband certainly couldn't <laughs> listen to me talk this long. Um, I very much appreciate, hopefully this was helpful. And these were the questions I asked at the very beginning of part one. So hopefully you have better ability to answer them now. And if you have any questions, if anything was unclear, do please leave any feedback in the comments. Thank you always for watching and I'll see you soon.